Uh, okay, welcome me, stage is mine. Hello everybody, name is Alexei. And, and yes, it's working. So, as it was told in the teaser, I will speak more about organizational changes and the real case uh, uh, story of agile adoption in a big organization. And by the, not only big, but the kind of conservative organization, according to all the possible stereotypes. Uh, so, it is a really epic story, and first of all, we need to speak about, so since we're talking about organizations, what it's all about. Uh, this is about TOLT, the biggest Lithuanian communication services provider, providing, having the huge infrastructure digged into the Lithuanian ground and on the ground, lots of information system. Okay, that 100 mentioned here to get you into this room is actually a smaller number possible because actually we have much more than 100 information systems, which is even worse. And uh, we have lots of different product services, uh, voice, internet, TV, IT services, and so on and so on. This number of products is growing constantly, which is very good for the sales guys. They always need more and very bad for us, IT guys, who need to implement solutions to manage all that stuff, to account that stuff, to register, and so on and so on. So really, this is big. This is industrial organization. You can find similarities here if you work for or have any kind of business with any kind of industrial organization in utilities, energy, transport, and so on and so on. So this is what will be all about. Uh, the purpose of my talk today is to show that different organizations' patterns may be compatible with the agile. Yes, agile differs from time to time. There are different kinds of agile, but uh, Altogether, it gained the, the, the real benefit when you not only implement Scrum, as my colleague said here, Scrum is not enough. Yeah, Scrum is totally not enough. Scrum is nothing. It's very easy to implement Scrum. Very hard to make that Scrum work for you. And that is only possible if you also feed the Scrum into your organization and then change your organization to get some benefits from that Scrum. So that will be the story of agile adoption in the big industrial conservative organization of three and a half thousand employees in the department of about 90 employees plus subcontractors, so more than 100, definitely. And my main goal is actually not only to tell and say, look uh, how well we are working now, just to encourage you to adopt Agile in whatever organization you have, guys, and to encourage you to change your organization to make it better, to seek for continuous improvement in your efficiencies. Uh, if you were here uh, a year ago, you probably know that I was talking about the Sun Tzu strategies and their applicability to the management, project management, and Agile particularly. Who heard my talk last year? Oh, very good. By the way, who, is, who are here Agile practitioners? Okay. Who, Heard about Agile, anything? Okay. Now I'm calm, I will not talk about Agile anymore. <laughs> Almost, but you are welcome to ask me any kind of questions about all that boring stuff like backlogs, user stories, and so on, how we do this. Because I know it's very, it will be very easy to answer because we do that every day, that's boring. So, the main idea in introduction to my talk is to remind you one of the stratagems of Sun Tzu, that army cannot make a big distance in one move. If you go 100 li in one move, you will lose your wagons, you will lose your soldiers, you will lose your army generals, and eventually you will lose the war. If you are stepping into organization in the high level of the disorganization, you need to change something fast, then to change something fast again, so you reach that in multiple steps. And that is the basis principle of all the story of all four transformations, kind of major transformations in organization we had during the past two years. Okay, it's a little bit more than two years now. This, I will talk about all these phases, starting from the phase zero, when we started everything and how did it look, and why we needed that change. Maybe some of you will recognize yourself. I will not ask you to raise your hands, because I, will, I think that you will not want to. Uh, stage one, it will be implementation of the systems factories approach, with some extensions. Then the changing the 
finding the proper place in global organization, okay, this will be agile organization already. Then you will realize that it's not enough. You need to find the proper place of that agile organization in the global in ecosystem, in the global organizations. That will be stage two. Then you will realize that you need to maneuver a little bit, like at war. You need to take some steps back and implement that archaic silos-based structures, just in order to make a final breakthrough, which will be the end of the story so far. But at the end of the story, uh, actually, me personally, I don't hope, I, I, I know that there will be more changes. Because now it's like a, it becoming a nice tradition, all this continuous improvement and changing both of your way of working, your methodologies, your technologies, and also the structure of organization. Sometimes lots of people just think, okay, organization is like this. No, it's not. You can change it. It's possible to change. It's possible to adapt. It's possible to change your way of working, the personal structure, the roles, responsibilities, the titles, and so on and so on. So, uh, what about those systems, by the way? Yes, as any kind of industrial uh, companies, we have a huge IT, IT assets uh, park. Uh, and we have 100 and plus uh, legacy systems. Some of them are new, some of them are 15 years old, some of them are standardized, some of them are built in-house. And you can imagine how can system look like if you build that system in-house for the 15 years. So it's like, uh, this is just a typical landscape of, of the solutions for the, such organization as TO or any kind of that organization. This is a business support system, operation support system, and so on. That is the source of that hundred coming from. And uh, actually, uh, this is the source of all the problems <laughs> that we had at the stage one. So stage one, so stage zero, sorry, May. Uh, stage zero was the initial stage of, uh, as I can, can bravely call it now, spaghetti and zombies organization, when it had all the work organized by the very narrow swimming clients called spaghetti. One system, whatever size of that system is, small application, bigger tool, huge information solution was, uh, let's say, uh, managed as a single worthy IT asset. And you were planning your resources, your headcounts. Okay. There, no, there were no teams yet. There were headcounts. And you plan your headcounts at some percentage, at some degree. One headcount or half headcount, 15 headcounts per system. So you have your all IT assets list and you plan for every tiny or big system some amount of the developers and analysts who will be working on that system a year ahead. Then you have this brilliant 100% utilization, which is very good, maybe for the service provider. If you are a service provider, that is very good. And we'll look uh, at the end of how bad it is for the, uh, for the customer, this 100% utilization. Uh, no resource sharing, no teamwork, no task management tools, huge disorganization, and lots of unmotivated people uh, who were very working. Yes, they were working hard, but nobody knew uh, what they're doing, actually, and how to get benefits from that. That was very, extremely good for the budgeting. That's why I think a number of conservative organizations use this approach for the IT department uh, work planning. But that's the worst possible organization for the scale of the real business prioritization. Actually, everything looked like that. You have this spaghetti swimming line. Each of them is uh, some kind of system. Number of people, or half people, or one-third people. Uh, 0.15, I remember, that was like a headcount for some applications, planned ahead for the year. And if you have this kind of planning, you have people just separated by some borders, by some walls, they are not helping each other, they are working on their swimming lines. And yeah, happily you have all the swimming lines full, fill, uh, filled with some tasks, with some work orders, work orders or change requests, whatever. In some cases, it's, it's, it's pretty okay. In some cases, you can see that this is like a Tetris game. Yeah, You're just filling that uh, swimming line just to make it fill. Sometimes work just doesn't fit if they have only half of man sitting behind there. In some cases, you have half a guy working on one task forever, and nobody knows when he will finish that. 
Some guy was just working, just working. It's just, he's a good guy, he's working. That is very good, again, for the utilization. Who can name me the biggest problem hiding behind that biggest benefit? Okay, yes, bad throughput, yeah, no scalability, yeah, but what is the worst here? Anybody? Huh? Heroes, yes, that, that's okay. Team management and the overall personnel situation was, yeah, it's bad, but what is the worst thing here? What can be the worst of your, of your motivation or your team scalability? Business, yeah. Business was the worst because in this case, every spaghetti was treated as the equal spaghetti. Imagine this system naturally is something very important. This is, this is the one that improves sales. This system, for example, is something that improves some accountant's user experience. And we cannot extend, expand this spaghetti by adding this guy and this guy in order to get more sales from the market. But these guys will sit here and continue making those five accountants happy. So we are expending the same amount of money on these services. As a service provider, you are happy, everybody is working, everybody is utilized, but business is not getting their outcomes needed because they cannot plan this system to be developed faster by adding these guys and suspending these projects more probably. So first step was, and actually it was not the situation when you can start talking with the business about uh, prioritization and suspending the projects and so on and so on. Remember that army passing the 100 Li in one move. You, that was just impossible to do. First of all, you need to do something good in your delivery and then start talking with business uh, users to, about their priorities and their, and their order prioritization and, and the benefits and suspending of some projects. So one thing, first step was to implement agile factories just to make actually spaghetti a bit thicker. <laughs> so you take that 100 systems and you group them by some functionality, by some similarities, by technologies and so on and so on. We created a three or four uh, subunits with the manager, with the all full, full team on, on board, analysts, developers and testers working on that stream of similar solutions. What was the benefit? The benefit was that they could uh, balance the resources uh, that customers, those our users of our organization, they were not informed about how many guys are working on their requests. So that was the first thing you needed to do. You need to hide that brilliant information about how many headcounts is working at this particular moment on your request. Because then we can balance that in our, in our delivery system. We can balance the teams here, we can uh, take people from here and move them there and so on and so on and make that absolutely hidden from the customers because uh, otherwise they will start fighting. All those guys, all those guys on these streaming lines, they will be very unhappy if, you, if we take this one and a half guy from here and move them here. There will be objecting, there will be politics, there will be arguing, and so on and so on. So you need to hide that and make everybody happy talking only about the delivery dates, the release plans, and so on and so on. So this factor is, uh, by the way, yes, we implemented Agile Scrum. That was easy. <laughs> Some form of that, of course. Uh, that was integrated this with the corporate work order lifecycle tool. The tool that we needed for the budgeting, approvals, and so on and so on. That was official. That was our own, our own business. And we even implemented automated KPI calculation for every of those, uh, of those factories. Actually, that factory is not a factory. It's a couple of factories. Smaller factory pretending they are working with the business in the old way. They're just receiving those old way work orders and converting them to the product backlogs. Our users were not ready yet to start working with backlogs. They got used to work with work orders, so we, we keep them comfortable. Yes, work with your work orders, with your corporate tools, and we will do the conversion to the backlog. We created separated swimming line backlog for the support incidents, and all of that is being mixed into Teams backlogs in the production factory. 
Production factory consists of one to three scrum teams, producing actually the releases on the iterational basis. As mentioned here, we still have scalability problem. Yes, spaghetti got thicker. We can balance between the spaghettis, but it's still the spaghetti. For example, if you at some point need to implement more of this and less of that for the company's sake, for the business, it was still a problem because there were just different departments and now all, we had all these factories being utilized fully or at some extent. Then we implemented, we again uh, hide something <laughs> and uh, created two dedicated so-called troopers teams, design team. Okay. <laughs> that was uh, uh, software developers agile enough to adapt to the new functionality, to learn something faster. Uh, also, the software developers and the tester on that team, they were fast and adaptable, and they were used to break through with the new functionalities. So we have this usual, regular factory team keeping the legacy stuff, keeping the support, keeping the usual work orders, the small tasks and so on, so all that boring stuff. The routine work was still produced by the, by, the, by the factory guys. But those troopers, they were used to make a breakthrough for the new projects, for something, new models, new functionality, for some re-architecturing, refactoring and so on. And we were just switching them. One time these troopers working with one factory, another time with another factory. That was reach of some factory level scalability already, and then, uh, yes, Harrison means the, this, uh, the, the permanent team. And uh, also it was very useful to just implement better documentation and, and better source uh, uh, management. You know, because these were new guys. Imagine guys working five years on the same system. They don't need documentation at all, yeah? So they understand everything. Analysts pass them some abstract tasks to them. They somehow understand those tasks. Nobody documents nothing. And uh, they produce some kind of releases there. And immediately, surprise, surprise, new guys are coming, knowing nothing about that system. That was first challenge for our analysts to start documenting tasks in the way that new guys would understand. That was actually all made for the sake. That was like a playground to get us ready to use the subcontractors, external power, to develop the same legacy systems for us. Yes, that failed, by the way. <laughs> uh, yes, those projects happened, but nobody was very happy. That was, but that, that was a very good experience. So now we are having, uh, by the way, just running a bit ahead, now we, we are practicing similar approach with the subcontractors, and that is working already. That was the first try and first fail. None of the trooper team succeeded with the delivery dates, and none of the analysts succeeded with the documentation to provide the troopers with something understandable. But that was a very interesting game to practice, to provide your documentation to your work orders to the new guys, and for the new guys to shape the source code in the form that the legacy developers can accept that and understand and support that. Through. These guys were excluded from the incidents. They were not resolving defects, um, support incidents, any bugs, and so on, so on. All bugs are resolved here. These guys are only for developing of the new stuff. That was interesting, yes, and that worked a little bit at some extent. Unfortunately, deadlines were failed. Then, then we realized that major stopper for us, all this factory here, factory there, and so on, and so on, is that we are still playing a customer and supplier game, but being Actually, virtually we were in house development office for the TO. Yes, then we were in Baltic data center. But we were, again, we had this waste of playing supplier and customer game, like pretending sometimes we have a real contract, we have a real work orders, we need to reach for some you know, profit and so on and so on. That was only a game and we understand that that is a waste and we need to improve that. So we just took all these factories and moved them to the another organization. That was interesting transition of the 50 employees. By the way, now one was lost. <laughs> now one was left behind. And that was the result of that, but you can take the factories, the units built like this, from one organization and practically, literally, sell them to another. And they will continue working there, just as it is. There was no one day of idle 
There were no one day of suspension of projects and so on. We just moved from one organization to another and we continue working. Yes, that was definitely possible because we had very close relationship with the TO and so on and so on. But it is still possible that it actually improves that this kind of organization is kind of can be placed anywhere if you create the proper, if you play according to this game. It's like a software with API. So you, you provide your API, as long as you're following that API, you're okay, you can use it. So we were providing our API in terms of that backlog here, release here, and that's it. And again, we already started working with the software developers. So our troopers extended from internal teams, a couple of those trial teams to the external partners. We made them working the way as we do. Yes, but we had the new challenges then. Of course, if you move from one organization to another and they have their own IT department, previously our customers, now they became our colleagues. Of course, the relationship was much warmer, but they were just a bit of strange organization when they were on their own roles and we are, again, doing the same way we did before, but as a colleagues. So we had natural redundancies of roles and the strange internal and external costs, misunderstandings. So we just reorganized that. Because it was in the air already that TO is approaching some new big cross-organizational change, so it was that maneuver back, back to the past, to this functional separation of the departments. Previously, remember, in that factory you have all the roles, all the titles in one factory responsible for the product. Manager, analysts, developers, testers, they're sitting as a production unit and they deliver the final result. Now we return to the analysts were here, developers were here, testers and some analysts were here. Different units with different management. Immediately we got the issues with the management, with the agile, and so on and so on. So that was like approved. Okay, what worked there? What worked in this kind of organization? It's had a lot of complication when you create that cross cross boundary of the departments, because you know everybody has their own managers, and uh, here it goes. Everything work goes through the hierarchy and it's not so easy to adapt, to implement, to, to react, and so on and so on. But that was still working. We just eliminated the redundancies in roles. Okay, we had now understanding who does what, the process, the workflow. The workflow was clear. And then, big change came. TO has changed this summer. We had a great restart of the of the TO for all the organizations, starting from the business units and uh, eventually finishing with the techno technology in our IT department. And uh, we created a kind of new structure from that legacy start, from that legacy functional silos organization. We just read some books <laughs> and created this network of the teams. Uh, just facilitating the theory of these uh, external and internal shapes, external and internal spheres, when some teams, teams, not the people, not the roles, teams are made as a contact point for the customers, for the market. Market was the all other organization, especially business uh, units of the organization. They provide external services, and everybody inside are providing services for the, and also made as a team, Providing services for the external teams. External teams are product teams, system teams. Again, something very similar to the factory, but just with no development inside. These are teams of the specialists, of experts of particular system. Product manager acting as a product owner for all of the, all of the backlogs for those systems. And the team of analysts responsible both for the analysis of the new feature and the second layer of support meaning that they are not only thinking about the future, which is very f lots of fun, but also supporting those uh, poor guys, users. They are let's say, like a first level of consulting when everybody's starting to using that software that we produced, and they realize that something was bad with the analysis. So that must be their responsibility as well, not only to create some new tasks for us, but also to be responsible for that at the end. That is benefit. This guy, okay, I will explain a bit. And um, internal sphere is a bunch of the teams. Some of them are software development teams, Scrum teams. 
And some of them are different services. For example, staffing team, like uh, development managers who can um, implement, a who can create a team for you, internal or external, whatever, depending on the budget and depending on the availability of resources. We have architect teams providing their services for the projects, like review, like uh, design, and so on and so on. We have a QA team, which is not more acting as a testers. Okay, they still test, unfortunately, but the main idea here is to, okay, let's go here. QA team should not test. They should create the tools to ensure the quality. So that's why we, we changed even titles of the guys. They're not testers anymore. They're quality assurance engineers. These guys here, analysts and product owners, they need to ask for the service, pull the service from that team. Just create us some tools and scenarios and the data and something, what we, we will use for the testing, these guys will test. And these guys will test. So at the initial, uh, at the stage of the analysis of the functional specification for the task, these guys complement that functional specification with QA tools and QA requirements built by these guys. They create scripts, they create automated testing tools, they create just test data, they create acceptance scenarios that these guys will use to accept work and these guys will use themselves to test, test, test and test. So testing now performed by the software developers actually, which is absolutely natural. These guys are responsible to provide some tools only. Uh, one other thing is that in case customers, our market, do not understand whom to contact or the, the, the project or work order is really complex going through all different systems across the factories. They, we have special bubble here, project managers, the guys who are contacted in these cases and they are distributing those requests across those other, other uh, bubbles of the first sphere and they have that consolidated plan of different of different uh, backlogs. So the, the plan here is very abstract. Okay, if you have a work order like this, you have BSS solution finishing here, OSS solution finishing here, electronic channels finishing here. So final deadline is like a total sum of all those deadlines. That's very simple. That's why only a couple of guys here can keep all those enormous amount of the requests. So they are just doing that consolidation of the, exec they are pro producing executive view of different backlogs. Believe me, we have a lot of backlogs here. First of all, we have five backlogs. Every red circle has their own backlog, product level backlog. Then we have teams. We're converting those backlogs sometimes directly to the team or sometimes we're just splitting that for the team. Especially if we're using one of these team may be a subcontractor externally. So we create a separated backlog for them. Users and customers here on the external, on the market level, they cannot understand all those backlogs. They're just too agile. So we need to create some executive view and that view is created here. Also, these red bubbles are responsible for the road mapping for the whole year. So they pr produce road map for their own system, for their own set of systems, by the way. All spaghetti are here inside, in this box, in this in, in, in the circle. They produce roadmaps, they produce technical specific uh, functional specifications, they produce backlogs, items, and prioritize them for the software developers. They do acceptance, and they communicate with these guys just to provide the executive view on the complex projects. Uh, what else, what else? Yeah, these guys are working on the Kanban. They have their own Kanban boards, moving the, every kind of request whether it be support request, like or consulting, or a new work order, which passing separated stages in the, on the Kanban board. These, and these guys are also working according to Kanban. Even us, managers, have our own Kanban board. We are acting as a team. Why teams here? Because one of these guys may be sick, or on vacation, and so on, but you still need some architectural services. Okay. Um, and uh, the same with this. So we try to avoid the personal assignment of tasks. Yes, it's still happening. Yes, it's still important who does what. 
because people are experts in some area and so on and so on, and they, they naturally get those tasks. But on the organizational level, and I require from everybody to act as a team. The team is responsible. If you fail, everybody fail. If you succeed, everybody succeed, and so on. So tasks on every sphere is just passing some abstraction layer of assignment of work to another team, not to another guy, to another team. And that's why they are exchangeable on the team level. Yes, benefits is, as I mentioned, autonomy and the self-organization of those teams. They can switch. They balance themselves. Who does what? Depending on their own load and so on. We have only two level of hierarchy, managerial hierarchy for this 85 employee organization. We do as less management as possible, as much just input for the functionality for the organization and measurement of the organization as possible. Uh, external sphere is a king. For every, every sphere, external sphere is a king. Right? They say and we must follow. This, all, everything must be oriented not to keep these guys busy or make them happy and so on. We need to make these guys happy, these guys need to make these guys happy and so on. Unfortunately, developers have nobody, nobody else whom <laughs> they can delegate making them happy. They must be happy themselves. Uh, which is naturally achieved by the making their work organized, taking the load of the contacting with unhappy or angry customers from the developers. They are just hidden from everybody in the organization. They're working with their backlogs. They have transparency on their roles and tasks and the statuses and so on. Everywhere working single window principle for the task. Home to pass the task. This is a window of next team. This is for you, team. And we have this uh, principle of extensibility by external troopers, so also trying to work according to our agile way uh, through these blue boxes of software developers. We just pretend those external guys are our uh, internal teams. Resource managers here, and me, myself, we take care about the contracting. Contracting is separated from the delivery. It is possible. You make contract, okay, you pay money somewhere here, okay, it's here. Here you just work. Work, work, work on by these priorities, by these backlogs, by, by this release plan, and so on and so on. And it fits to our technology organization, which also take care of all our technologies department is much, much bigger. There are a few hundred people in that, also taking care of hardware, telco equipment, all those Wi Fi points, all those uh, data centers, and so on and so on. Yes, everybody loves kittens. You will ask questions about how can we do that. So methodology. The book, what was read, is, was definitely Neil's uh, flagging, which we were arguing heavily last year here. I was the greatest, let's say, opponent for him. I didn't like his theory at all. Eventually, I, I am trying to implement that. <laughs> you can go to that site, read all those PDFs there, and uh, try something at home. It's OK, it's working. Another thing is just the tools we are using. Yes, it's just very simple tools. Everybody can afford. Unfortunately, we're still missing a good tool for the road mapping from the idea to the technical task. I still have this dream to find the tool to start from here, to start from the even more, to start from the marketing and sales road mapping and pass it to the technical projects and technical tasks. No such tool on the market. Very good niche, by the way. You can implement, I will buy it. Uh, we are dealing with Excel, yes. Excel is, is, is all, as, as usual. We have internal, still having this legacy tool for the work order, life cycle management, for the budget approvals, and so on and so on. But it is actually kind of seamlessly integrated in all this process. You start with the Excels, then you put that something to official tool, then you put that into the backlogs, all kind of backlogs. Use just very simple tools for the requirement engineering. We try to go to the magic draw, to some repository, and that will happen next year. And we have special system for the support engineers. Again, integrated with this guy. All teams in the internal sphere, they are working with the team foundation server backlogs of any kind. Kanban, Scrum, Scrumban, whatever it is. These are integrated to that. This is integrated to that. Everything is put eventually in the team foundation server. This is just one of the options. There are different other tools which can be used. 
uh, just because we have a lot of Microsoft technology in house, so that was obvious choice. What's next? Okay, since that started this summer, this organization started this summer, and we're still learning how to deal with it. We have about a half a year or maybe a year to prove it works and very good for the KPIs. That will be uh, the outcomes expected next year and benefits. And then we will try to spread this knowledge across the organization and implement similar organizational structures in other, first of all, technology, technology department, all those guys who deal with, software, with hardware, telco, telco equipment and, and, and services. And maybe even more, maybe we will uh, step over the boundaries and go to the business guys and uh, operational guys who serve you in those customer service on the street. Do you have any questions? Welcome. Thank you, Alexei. Thank you. Hi, uh, I have a question about uh, how do you follow the progress on each of your business objective, so to speak, if, because how I understand, you are splitting your backlogs into smaller backlogs, and then it's, I understand that in TFS you can like link things to each other, but it's, it's still, what, do you have any challenges with this? Of course, that's why I'm looking for the consolidated tool to automate all this uh, progress uh, tracking from here to here. So far, we have very good progress tracking on this level. Almost good progress tracking on this level. A little bit worse in manual progress tracking on the external sphere level. That's why all those excels. In order to communicate to the external sphere, to the markets, our product guys, red bubbles and orange bubble, they need manually to update to keep those excels updated. All other is more or less automated. You just put in one backlog, it just follows to the smaller backlogs, to the team boards, and so on and so on. So yes, yes, but this, no, it's, it's possible to do it. Yes, if, that, if I find the tool, the tool, the tool, so yes, that will be automated as well. Any more questions? I uh, have you probably... Uh, thought about the idea to use the same tool that is being used for low-level tracking for high-level tracking just by associating items. As example, I can tell you that uh, we used in our projects uh, terms as epics and visions and they are the same tickets. We use Jira. Okay. You can link uh, high-level tickets in one project to lower-level tickets in another. We are organizing our product backlogs in that way. So we use the current TFS Team Foundation server capabilities allows to have a free level hierarchy for the functional items. Something like Epic, okay, it's, it's called initiative or, or something like that. So we use all that in the backlog. Those, exter those market customers, market users who are smart enough or okay, IT savvy enough to understand and to run TFS tools to, to look at that, they do that. Some of them cannot. So that's why we need to keep those Excels just in order to have the reporting on executive level. Can you not export this high level list and automate it in this way? Because I was using this approach. Still working on that. Okay. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Uh, how you solve the tickets, bugs in this diagram? There is okay. no... Uh, yeah, yeah. Tickets, uh, bugs go from here and being assigned to some development, uh, developer uh, team here. Uh, this is the second level of support. This is the third level of support. First level of support is a separate organization, service desk, the, the place you call if you have any kind of TO-related problem. And uh, if anybody was on my presentation uh, about the... Uh, dealing with the support and still practicing the Scrum, uh, there was an approach of having the, like, backlog is being combined of two swimming lines. One is for the plant work with commitments, with release plan and so on, and one is just keeping uh, free, keeping uh, vacant for all of those ad hoc tasks and support level. So we do not plan all the team capacity here 100%. We plan the work only for, the, for example, 70%, and 
and keeping those 30% for the ad hoc tasks coming. If no support incidents, okay, they do something more for the plant work. If support incidents, they, they, they will fill that time. So we are not booking them 100%. Maybe a little bit boring question, but in this kind of structure, how do you deal with the uh, ownership of tools? As I understand, currently QA is creating tools for other parts of the organization. Yeah. Uh, if there are changes required in the tool for some reason, but they are working on something else, who is the one who is actually uh, they, owning the tool? They just create tools for these guys, and they become users of the tools created by these guys. Ownership of the system is here. These guys are only providing services. They, they do not own. These guys are owners. We have also functional owners somewhere here. Those guys who uh, uh, use the system on a daily basis. They are functional. But usually the same system is used by different guys. One used for, for, for one purpose, for example, for some uh, digging holes in the ground and, and putting there some telco equipment and other guys using the same big system for just for, for I don't know, for, for switching on and off some Wi-Fi points and so on. So these functional owners are separated here. But the system ownership is, is, is in red bubble. Uh, I have a, another question in terms of uh, the tools you mentioned you're using. So for large complex projects, you're using MS Project. So is it connected to Team Foundation servers? Uh, is it connected to your backlogs or is it separated? Uh, who uses MS Project? Is it only the project managers or you share with engineers, customer? The tools? Only project managers and uh, product owners in those red bubbles use or have a look on the MS project. MS project is only used as a presentation tool, actually. It's not connected to anywhere, unfortunately. So that's why I say uh, I look for, the, for that brilliant tool I can, imp uh, I can put and link everything together. We already tried Jira. It doesn't work. We already tried MSF. It doesn't work on full scale. We looked on the Microsoft project server. It still is not the tool. Because I need the tool which comes starting from the marketing idea. Some marketing guy just rises in the morning and says, oh, we need to sell this. And starting at that point, we need to track everything to the support incidents. That is a challenge. We have two minutes more, so any questions? Hello. My question is not about the process, but about the uh, result. Uh, how do you measure that you're successful after your reorganization? Or how do you measure a successful? Very good question. <laughs> uh, we still have two minutes. Uh, OK, this thing is not, not working anymore. Uh, we have our all the department level KPIs. Uh, related to budget, fitting and budget, and related to the uh, delivery metrics, for example, to uh, fitting in our promised terms and deadlines for, for, the, for the work orders. So we just take the all statistics of all the work orders and our commitments, and we measure our meeting our commitments on the work orders. This is about delivery. On the financial perspective and resource usage, we measure our not overspending of the planned annual budget and so on. These are like major metrics. Okay, we also have metrics related to the HR, like uh, some employee satisfaction and so on and so on. But these are the major commitments, systems availability, and uh, fitting into the OPEX and CAPEX budgets. And then we, 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 we just uh, delegate parts of these KPIs from the whole department to the teams. For example, for example, okay, cat again. These guys again, they are responsible for those metrics, for their their part of the systems, for the commitments, for the work orders. But they also have some more metrics on their own. We have these guys also having some percentage of the KPIs from the commitments there and system availability. No, no more budget uh, uh, responsibilities here again. But they have their own KPIs as well. For example, just doing something with Scrum, some technology and so on. So we create 
specific KPIs and part of delegation of the unit level KPIs here, specific KPIs and unit level KPIs, and unit level KPIs are pure business oriented, like money and fitting in your deadlines. That's all. We will get our bonuses according to this level of the KPIs, you know, like, and then evaluate everybody according to their own metrics. Team level metrics, by the way. Okay, thank you, Alexei. Our time is up. Feel free. Thank you.